if you want, you probably can take like two questions, yeah. or otherwise you can also take them outside, up to you. Yeah, I can, if there is any questions, or people are moving on to the next talk. Yes, any questions for Peter? Otherwise, I think he will be available outside as well. Great, thank you. All right, cool, thank you very much. Perfect, and we're just going to move on straight away with Ben, who's talking about building on wrap to Web3 with a Brave browser. Give it up for Ben. <laughs> the kickers of that. Aha. Uh -huh. Good. So it's great to be here. This is such a cool and unusual setup. Let's wait for the people to <laughs> leave and for things to settle. So let's do, while we're waiting, let's do a bit of audience participation. How about a uh, uh, you know, show of hands? How many of you use Brave? Yeah, so quite a lot. Thanks. OK. So, uh, so then in many ways, this is going to be a status update. So we did an ICO about a year later. We did a bit of kind of accounting, focusing what, on what we've accomplished since then. So I'll cover that. And then uh, we'll look into the future. And the future, I think, includes some of the things we've heard about before this morning uh, related to Web 3.0. So, um, well, let me get into this, actually. So uh, first, let's talk about the token, and let's do so briefly. So I mentioned that there was an ICO we went through. That's not really the focus of today's talk, but this is uh, one of the ways in which the Brave browser is quite different from other browsers. So uh, the browser has a wallet inside, and this, in many ways, is we hope is a way for users to get into the space of crypto. We'll talk about how that will happen in our view, but let, let me put this out there first. So uh, if you're interested in this, there's a website that covers the timeline that focuses on what we've done since then. So I'll show some of the things, I'll highlight them, but this is a quite an instructive thing to uh, check out uh, as well. So some of my goals for today. I'll tell you about the Brave browser, some of the things we've been doing, and some of the things we want to do going forward. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, BAT, the basic attention token, and I'll tell you lastly about some of the pathways we consider to make it so that the browser is a conduit for Web 3.0 for the regular user. So here's a summary, here's a one slide summary of our vision for what Brave as well as BAT uh, will deliver uh, for the end user. We are trying to enable privacy by default. Largely what we are doing today is we are doing ad blocking, we are also doing fingerprinting prevention, we'll have some other features as time goes by as well. So this is goal number one. The second goal is we're trying to reform digital advertising the way it's done today. There are tons of inefficiencies, there are tons of ad fraud, there are many, many third-party trackers. All of that doesn't have to be there. We're trying to build a system for them from the ground up that is efficient and actually accomplishes the goal of both advertisers and also benefits the users as well as publishers in the process. Specifically, though, once our advertising system is operational, which will happen in the next couple of months, our goal is to pay users in bad if they choose to watch advertising. It's a pretty different model from what we've seen before, but this is also a way, if you think about it, for the regular users to get into crypto. I'll come back to that idea in just a few slides, but just hold on to that thought for a second. Ah, uh, come on, there you go. So let's step back from this and think about how uh, things are as of today. So this is a screenshot of, what is it, The Economist, the popular news magazine out there in the UK. And if you look at it, this is what it looks like on the surface. Then if you do a little bit of analysis, and you can do this kind of analysis with the help of a browser extension, or you can go into your browser's dev tools and check out what's going on as well. But a site like this, as of a couple of months ago, this is, I think, pre-GDPR as well, has dozens upon dozens of trackers, third-party trackers, watching the user as they browse the web. 
this is not the first party, this is a third party. The user genuinely does not know that these uh, entities are out there, but there are all, sort of, all sorts of advertising networks that are observing the user and their presence. And of course, they also build up user profiles as they go from one site to the next to the next and so on and so forth. Why do they do that? Well, it's not just for fun, it's for profit, right? Why? Because the better they understand the user, as well as the user's preferences, the better you can do things like ad targeting. Now, this is a practice that's hugely privacy violating, and this is the practice that we are trying to curtail. Users, on the other hand, pay a pretty high price already for these kinds of uh, third-party tracking practices. So these, these numbers come from a measurement, so there are some data sources over there at the bottom, but let me just summarize it for you. So on a typical mobile page load, there are seconds that are being wasted for loading a heavy page, such as this Economist page over there. Trackers, I mean, their numbers are huge. I showed you a page that has dozens of them, but sites like TMZ as of about a year or two ago had over 100 trackers on that one page alone. If you focus on metered connections, right, nobody has, not everybody rather has an unlimited connection on their mobile plan, this is, you know, do, uh, dollars and so forth that are being spent on content that you ultimately don't want to interact with and you didn't ask for in the first place. And lastly, Advertising channels are also a major source of malware as well as ransomware. So there's a term malwaretizing in this space that describes exactly this practice. So there are lots of issues with the way advertising is done today on the internet. What's the response? In the last 10 years, we've seen a huge growth in terms of the numbers of users who use some form of ad blocking. So let's do another show of hands here too, which is how many of you have used some sort of ad blocking software, any kind of ad blocker? Okay, so I'd say about like 80% within this crowd. That's not the case everywhere. So if you look at the numbers in Germany, these numbers are actually quite high, maybe about 40%. But as you can see from this chart, you know, they've been basically climbing year after year after year. So people are voting with their feet. They do not want this invasive third party content to be staring them in their face. And this is not the end of the story. As of this year, I would say, especially in the UK and other parts of Europe, we've seen the rise of paywalls. These days, I would argue, it's actually quite difficult to find high quality journalism, high quality content without running into some sort of a paywall. Most of the sites I go to, like say The Guardian even, which has been free for many, many years, these days it asks the user to contribute. Why? Because the old model is simply not working. They cannot sustain the model that's based on ads. And the reason for that is really quite simple as well. It's because the click-through rates are abysmal. They're really, really low. So for many publishers, I would argue most publishers, the old model that's based on advertising supporting seemingly free content is no longer functional, which is why we see the rise of these paywalls. This is a little bit different in the US than it is in Europe. These things develop at different uh, speeds uh, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, you know, the poster child for this kind of development is sites like the Wall Street Journal in the US and the FT in the UK. Those sites have been traditionally paid sites, very difficult to get their content. And other sites, high quality sites, are following the same trend. Now, I mentioned something just a few minutes ago about compensating the user, about paying the user to watch commercial, to watch ads, which sounds like a rather crazy idea, but think about it this way. So suppose we build a system in the browser where the user can earn a little bit of crypto, say five baht or something like that, uh, throughout the day, they might watch a few commercials, maybe one or two or three or four, not a lot. And these will be high quality experiences. So maybe there's going to be a video that they'll see about a brand such as, I don't know, Volvo making this up. So don't, don't uh, uh, you know, this is, just, this is just one simple example. Now, during the rest of the day, as they browse, they would be able to get through these paywalls 
to read articles occasionally. Like, I don't want to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal to read one article a day. It doesn't make sense to me, number one, financially. Number two, I cannot uh, manage my subscriptions, right? Like, I can barely manage a couple of subscriptions, not to mention dozens. So wouldn't it be a good experience for a user to be able to earn some tokens by watching a few ads every once in a while? and then redeem those tokens by getting through these paywalls. Seems like a pretty natural match, but this is not an experience we have had thus far. Thus far, we've relied on a seemingly free ad, uh, web browser that's been sponsored by largely third-party advertising. Yeah? Plus, of course, on top of that, we've had the two walled gardens that dominate the landscape, those two, of course, are Google and Facebook, which are responsible for something like uh, last year, close to 90% of advertising revenue has gone to either Google or Facebook, which means that the other guys, these third parties, are squeezed out anyway. So their business is largely crumbling. Okay. So... The old deal is simply not working. If you're interested in this, go read this book by Tim Wu. It's really quite insightful, called The Attention Merchant. Came out, I think, a couple of years ago. And there are also some numbers for you on the right-hand side of the slide. So some of the click-through rate estimates, and of course, these things vary based on the type of content, the type of website, and so forth. But this is an eighth of a hundred to one percent click-through rate. So imagine how many impressions you need to throw a end user to get a single click. And of course, a click doesn't mean a conversion, right? So there is a great deal of activity out there on the web, and there has been for the last decade pretty much, if not longer, which is tremendously inefficient, wastes a lot of compute power and networking capacity and so on and so forth and ultimately does not result in what advertisers want to, res to, to result in. Now, for a more targeted model, such as, for example, what happens on Twitter, though, click-through rates are a lot higher, which means that if you do know something about the user, you are able to deliver ad experiences that are a lot more efficient. And that's actually something to respect, actually. This is not a bad observation. It's just that the way in which it's done which is privacy violating by, uh, by design, effectively, is something that we need to walk away from. So that's where the basic attention token you know, comes in. This is where this you know, Bermuda Triangle of advertising, as I call it, so the interactions between users and publishing and advertising come in as well. Um, some of the pain points, I think I've covered some of these things. Uh, I talked about, you know, issues for the users, but I haven't really talked about issues for, I don't know, for example, advertisers, right? So the issue of ad fraud is really quite prominent. So they say that some of the estimates claim that something like half of the money that's spent on ad goes, ads that goes nowhere. These are not ads that are seen by anybody. They're below the fold. They're just dropped on the floor, things like that. So this is an ecosystem that's ultimately suffering and just kind of not sustainable the way it's been done for quite a while, which is why we're trying to build something else and we're using uh, our browser, we're using Brave as the cornerstone of this building activity. So, uh, right, so the, it proceeds in different stages. So right now, we are basically at the end of the Gemini stage. We're entering the next stage. The first stage is where we have users and we have publishers. And you can have a little bit of cryptocurrency in your browser, and you can use that cryptocurrency to contribute to the publishers that you like. So, for example, you enjoy reading articles on Wikipedia, you can decide that Wikipedia will receive most of your monthly uh, spend. So we have some number of users who are doing exactly that, and they're satisfied with that model, and this is just the beginning for us. This is a way for us to sort of debug the system, debug interactions between users and publishers, get the publishers on board, get the users familiar with uh, this model, and so on and so forth. The next system involves advertisers as well. This is a way to deliver advertising within the browser, cutting out the middlemen building a system that's sufficient and also privacy preserving by design. And then the last stage of this, which comes, I'm sure, much after, is uh, much more exciting interactions between publishers and users and effectively moving closer to Web 3.0, where 
payments and transactions become fairly commonplace. I'll give you some examples of that as well. So what we have so far, uh, these are not the latest slides, unfortunately. So these screenshots are slightly out of date. The UI keeps changing, so please bear with me. You can go and download the latest beta. It will look slightly different from this, but that's OK. Uh, so we have a payment system uh, for anonymous contributions within the browser. The user can come in. They can put a little bit of crypto into the browser. That crypto will go to the publishers they would like to support. These things can be tweaked by the end user. They also have a way to uh, uh, basically get a report of their contributions at the end of the month. So this one, for example, shows something about, say, Coindesk receiving 28% of my contributions and then another site like the Smithsonian Magazine receiving 8% of my contributions. And I know about this, but Brave doesn't know about this, and those publishers don't really know where these contributions come from. So we build basically this firewall of anonymous contributions. This is one of the things we have in the browser, and this highlights the principle of building things in a way that's privacy-preserving by design. Uh, this is one of the uh, systems that we use in the browser. We're moving away to blinded tokens, actually, from this system. But you know, if you want to look at the details, I'm happy to talk about some of that offline as well. Some illustrations for this, but basically uh, going back to what I said before, so we're building a better user experience. Users will receive a share of the revenue. And so in the case of what's called private uh, user private ad slots, they'll receive 70% for viewing the ad and ads, and some of that will go to Brave as well. There are other kinds of ads where the revenue will be largely given to the publisher and the rest will be shared between the user and Brave. So we're starting with the first kind. As I said before, we're hoping to ship that uh, relatively soon in the next couple of months. So uh, this is something we've been experimenting with for quite a while. We are really keen, and I'd like to highlight that as well. You know, we've been shipping the browser for quite a while now. There is a release. I mean, there is a drop of some kind, a binary drop, pretty much every single week. And that's our focus as well. So I've been fairly heads down. Uh, uh, building, building, this, uh, building the browser, updating it. There is a new beta as of last week, which is 22% faster than the browser we had before. I encourage you to check it out. If you like, to, if you like trying out beta software, please go try it out. Uh, the point here is that there is a strong focus in execution. We have a team of about 90 people uh, that's fairly distributed uh, as well. So there is quite a lot to do. Um, some of the statistics, again, this is slightly out of date. I'm not sure why these slides are uh, here. So we actually have more like 4. Point, I think 2 million users. These are monthly numbers. So we hit about 10 million downloads on the Android marketplace. Uh, the majority of these users are in the US and uh, the EU. Uh, user growth remains strong, and so on and so forth. Something about the number of publishers. So I think this number is higher as well. We have over 4,000 verified publishers, publishers who's, uh, who've decided to go through the KYC process with Brave. We have over 10,000 YouTube channels as well. So the moment we announced that we now accept YouTube channels owners or creators, we within a week had about 10,000. And the reason for that is also quite simple. It's simply that Google is demonetizing a lot of those people, and they want to find another source of revenue. And some number about the total, uh, you know, some statistics about the total number of subscribers for those YouTube channels as well. By now, these numbers are a little higher than what I have here on the slide. Also, yeah. So this is actually more up to date. Uh, so these numbers are a little bit more updated. So yeah, there you go. So actually, this shows 23,000, uh, more than 23,000 verified publishers by now. There you go. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on finding partners, and these partners for us, uh, it's quite a mix, but a lot, a lot of them are major publishers, or groups of publishers. So we have a partnership with Town Square Media. We have, uh, but it's not only that, right? So we have, uh, say, a partnership with DuckDuckGo as our default search engine in private browsing mode. We have integrated MetaMask. We uh, uh, have been running these trials and so on and so forth. Quite a mix of sort of announcements and things of that sort. Okay. 
All right, so let's switch gears for just a second. This was uh, kind of a slightly long update on our progress with the Brave Browse, and that's frankly what we spent most of our time on day to day. Anyhow, so my mind is very much there. But let's look into the future as well. So what can a browser like Brave do for Web 3.0? My hope is that eventually it will serve as a gateway to the decentralized applications like the ones we've been hearing about since about 9 o'clock this morning. So uh, some of the building blocks we've already seen, but I would argue there are probably others as well. So we have a wallet in the browser that supports BAT. That's one bit. We are open to providing decentralized identity, although we would like largely for the user to rename anonymous as well. What exactly we want to provide in the browser can be debated. Uh, we, want it to, we want the user to be, I'm sorry, we want the browser to be a trusted user agent, right? So there's this phrase user agent that's used on the web, but what, what exactly does it mean? Well, I think we are open to experimentation in that space as well. So for example, nowadays, just about every site in the EU you, you go to uh, you know, gives, uh, has this kind of cookie wall experience that says, well, please accept all these cookies. You sometimes can select what you want to accept, that sort of thing. But ultimately, as a user, you don't really get very much guidance as to whether you should actually accept the experience that the site is giving to you, you should reject it, and so on and so forth. So what if the browser were able to advise you on these decisions? What if the browser were able to highlight privacy policies of websites that you probably shouldn't interact with? Wouldn't that be fairly helpful? Because at this, at this point, you know, this idea of informed consent, I think, has gone way too far. The user, a regular person, simply most of the time doesn't have any ability to decide which of these prompts that should say yes to. And as such, most of the consent that we see is not really well informed. So the browser can play an integral part in those interactions also. So I mentioned the wallet in the browser, I mentioned MetaMask, I mentioned other things. So for example, there's, a, I think, still an open uh, issue on GitHub. Uh, uh, for the Brave repo on integrating RPFS. And this highlights something that I wanted to mention as well, which is we are busy working on the browser itself, largely. So we need people, people from this community, people like yourselves, to come in and help us a little bit in terms of integration with some of the exciting technologies that we've been hearing about uh, thus far. So we are really quite open to interactions with people and uh, building things out, but uh, we eventually will need to merge with some of the technologies that, uh, technologies that are coming up. So um, Right, so I wanted to share another idea with you as well. So I talked about one scenario, which is the user earning cryptocurrency, and that's important because th that serves as a conduit for a regular person into the crypto space, right? So what's your alternative, really, right? So you'll, you'll go and run uh, to crypto, I mean, to a Bitcoin ATM, and from that, you know, not very many people will choose to do that. So building an on-ramp like that is important. Now, what about sort of other interactions on the web that are exciting that could be enabled by the browser? Let's, let's get back to the idea of valuing user attention. So one of the most interesting scenarios that we have currently is you know, the scenario of a social network like Twitter, right? And so imagine, so what happens now? So now if you get lots of uh, likes on your posts, lots of retweets, you get a lot more popular, you get promoted by Twitter, you can what? What can you do with this, right? Like what can you do with Twitter fame? Well, maybe you can become some sort of a celebrity, maybe you can get a job offer or many, maybe you can become the president of the United States. I don't know, there are several options out there, right? Okay. So what if, you could, what if that attention can be directly monetized? So imagine a version of Twitter where every like results in a micropayment, every retweet results in a micropayment as well. That would be a way to actually monetize the uh, attention that uh, you are getting as a Twitter participant. 
Now, as we probably all understand, popularity does not mean quality. There is a lot of stuff that's on Twitter that's really quite terrible in all sorts of different ways. That's fine. We're not going to necessarily solve that problem. But if you could enable micropayments in a context such as this, that would be quite exciting. Um, uh, so I don't know that I want to necessarily uh, talk about that. Let me skip this. Uh, I had another scenario that I wanted to cover. Maybe. Maybe not. Sorry about that. So the, this is a different uh, slide deck that I, I thought I submitted here. But anyhow, so uh, I'm happy to uh, take questions. And I think they told me to take them outside. Yeah, is that still the plan? Time for one question, please. One question from the audience. Yes, you, sir. Uh, Not hear you. Oh. Uh, in the light of the ad apocalypse on YouTube, like how how do you feel, or how how does Brave relate itself to uh, the conflict between advertisers and publishers who like don't like either the advertisers, advertisers don't want to see the ads on the particular publisher's side, or the other way around, the publisher doesn't want to see ads from competitors and so on, which which you know obviously affects like publishers and like pe people on YouTube like creating content and not getting paid because. Advertisers don't like the content, or uh, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question. But the first uh, version of the ad uh, system, which will ship, will basically not rely on the publisher, right? So this will be done outside of the uh, site context. It will be something that just pops up. It will be delivered independent of the underlying website. So that way, you hopefully do not associate the content of the website with the content of the ad. Maybe that's what you're asking about. But yes, in principle, there is some sort of a conflict that happens some of the time between what the advertiser wants and what the publisher wants to host. And that's another problem in the old system as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. I think you